very impressive uh, uh, bios of both of you. It makes me wonder what on earth I've been doing with my life. But uh, <laughs> we certainly know uh, what you two have been up to. And Carol, I'll start with you first. We spoke of uh, problems being overcome when uh, Sam Cawthorn was up on stage and, and he told such a wonderful story about if you think you've got problems, other people have problems too. Now, he mentioned elite athletes. What sort of problems could you possibly have to overcome? <laughs> Well, injury is probably the biggest problem that we have to face. And those of you sitting in the front row, you can probably see some scars on my knees. I should have probably worn uh, uh, no. stockings. But um, <laughs> I actually played indoor volleyball for 10 years before I even got my, my toes sandy. So, and it was only by accident, and it was a real accident, that I started playing beach. I actually was in the air. I landed. I twisted. I completely ruptured my cruciate ligament, my medial ligament, and all my cartilage and meniscus. And pretty much damaged my knee beyond repair for indoor volleyball, made the switch to the softer surface. But during that time, it took about a year, and during that time, I became very depressed, as you would, 10 years at the top of your sport. Um, I'd played overseas professionally, and I needed something to change my mindset and to get me back up again. Um, three months, I was sitting on the couch, unable to put any weight through my leg while I had three surgeries to fix the damage. Um, I lost 10 kilograms, and I don't weigh a lot anyway, um, but I literally couldn't get up and go to the fridge. Um, and it wasn't until my boyfriend at the time brought me home a brand new white volleyball, and I, the first thing I did was look at him and I started crying. I thought, what am I going to do with that? I can't even walk yet. He said, Kerry, on each panel of this ball, I want you to write a goal, and then I want you to date that goal, and bit by bit, I want you to get back to playing sport again and, and indoor volleyball. That's what I thought I, I wanted to do at that time. I didn't know yet that I couldn't. And it was such a massive moment for me, as Sam mentions. What's the word that he used, the, the Greek word? Yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> and um, it was one of those moments. I went, wow, OK, I'm, now I've got this challenge ahead of me. Um, I want to play my sport again. I had the passion. I just didn't know how to do it. And as soon as I realized that all I had to do, and Dr. Roger just before mentioned the backwards planning, all I had to do was work out, well, here I, I want to get back to playing sport for Australia. I just had to plan it out. So on each panel of the ball, I wrote the goals, starting with jumping in water and, and just moving my legs in water right through to playing sport again. So for me, setting goals was magical. And having it in front of me every single day on something three-dimensional, something creative, um, it not only reminded me to do the steps that I needed to do, it actually reminded people around me. I mean, how many of you have set goals but hidden them away so no one can see them? <laughs> You know, it happens. We don't want to share it just in case we fail. Um, but I put it out there and people would come around saying, oh, have you done that one yet? Have you done that one yet? And I'd, be, I'd have to do it to get back to where I wanted to go. Kerry, you know how impressed I am and how much I admire you as a woman and an athlete, but I'm struggling to feel sorry for someone that sits on the couch for three months and loses weight. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anne, we'll move on to you. Now, Anne, you had, uh, you had a little a little bit of a different entry into elite sport uh, because you actually weren't involved in the sport. Can you just uh, briefly take these wonderful people through how you actually got involved in extreme sport and why you picked one that you can die doing? <laughs> sure. So I, I had never been successful in any sport. And I guess by default I actually went, found out that I got a lot of satisfaction in helping other people learn how to do their sport really well through coaching them, through teaching them. Um, techniques around sports psychology. Um, and then I found myself working with athletes that were doing more and more dangerous sports. So I was working with guys who were racing motorcycles or basic base jumping, um, towing, big wave surfing, that sort of thing. And they reached a point in my career where I, I found for myself I had a real need. Like I really needed to know, I'm telling people how to do all this stuff, but I wonder if can I apply the same techniques for myself and get really good, or at least a certain level of proficiency with the sport. So I looked around, and at the time I was living in the south of France, and over there there's kind of a couple of edgy sports. There's bullfighting, and, uh, <laughs> and the other one is freediving. So I went with the lesser of the two evils uh, and went with freediving. And um, freediving is a sport where you basically you go out into the ocean, um, usually on a boat, and you go out into very deep water. And then they'll run a rope down into this deep water, and they'll send tags down to the bottom. And the goal is to see who can swim down the greatest depth on a single breath of air and make it all the way back to the surface without blacking out. Um, sounds crazy. Um, but it's actually a sport that has a, 
it teaches you so much about yourself. It's, it's been amazing and what I've learned about myself through doing this sport. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's unusual and it is a high risk sport, but it's a sport that I say combines two quite primal fears that I think everyone has. That's why I call them primal. You have this fear of sinking deep into, into the unknown where basically at the start it's this beautiful turquoise blue and then as you sink down it goes to deep blue and then to dark blue and then you might be halfway down and it's, it's pitch black. And you know that you've still got to fall for another minute or two. And you combine that fear with this other fear, which is a fear of suffocation, of simply not being able to draw breath when you may extremely want to have a breath. Um, so for me, it was around, I want to learn a sport where that, that is truly demanding. I want to learn how, how to manage myself and become more self-aware in times where I'm under phenomenal pressure to see if I can kind of be OK with it. Did you guys ever play that game when you were kids with your friends in the pool where you see if you can hold your breath for a whole lap? Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> you did tell me how many laps you can do. How many was it? Uh, it's about nine, nine laps. Yeah, about. that's just showing yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it talks about uh, believing in yourself and needing to uh, set targets. What is it that sets high achievers apart? What's so different in the belief system of the two of you that, that makes your goal setting so high and, and makes you have that self-belief? Well, for, for me, it, um, winning a gold medal in Sydney against the best team in the world, um, we had only beaten the team that we, we won the gold medal against once in 17 matches over three years. Uh, so we knew in the build-up to that that we had to do something. We had to have some sort of edge over them. We knew we couldn't train anymore. I was starting to deal with more knee injuries. Natalie was starting to get injured. So we had to sort of just be careful about how much we did physically. So for us, and, and I'll never be able to thank the guy that came on board with us enough. His name is Kirik Ashley. He's a success coach, not a sports psychologist, but a personal development success coach who... Um, surrounded himself with people like Tony Robbins, so he did the crazy glass walking and fire walking, which some of you have probably done and we started to do. But what, what he did for our team was just develop the belief in ourselves. And for me, that is the key ingredient to anybody's success. From silver to the gold, it's the belief in yourself. And the reason I, I know that now, looking back, is because the night before the gold medal match, we were down in Bondi. We were actually staying at the Swiss Grand, which is over the road from the Bondi, um, the beach where we had our 10,000-seat stadium. And I wasn't sleeping at all the night before. I was so excited. Natalie as well, but we didn't want to let on to the other one. We wanted to make sure that, that the other one was getting a good rest. I said to her a few weeks later, I said, Nat, what were you thinking about that night? She just looked at me and she said, I was practising my victory speech. And I looked at her and I said, so was I. So there were two unknown Aussies in, well, we were ranked third in the world going into the Olympics, but no one believed in us. No, not even our National Federation believed that we could win on that day. But there we were. We didn't care what other people thought. We had developed such a strong belief um, throughout the, the year and a half that we worked with Curic and the rest of our team. There were five of us on the, on the court that day. Two of us were playing. The other three were in the stands. <laughs> Uh, but we had our, our coaches, we had our physical coach, we had our volleyball coach, and we had our mental coach. So to create the, the greatest success in your life, you've got to have those mentors, as, as you heard just previously as well, and you've got to have the people around you. Build that really strong team around you to help build that belief. And for us, the difference between the bronze that we won in Atlanta, for instance, and the gold in Sydney was just that pure belief that we could win. And it's funny because when I watched uh, the beach volleyball and I was in the stands for uh, several of the matches uh, in Sydney 2000 and it, was quite a, it wasn't until I went home afterwards that I thought, wow, I look out and I see these athletes jumping, spiking, digging, whatever. What's it feel like to be in front of 10,000 people <laughs> in your bikini? Uh, <laughs> that takes naked. <laughs> well, it does. It is part of our sport, and a lot of people ask me that question. Thank you, Steph, for bringing that up. And it gets up. smaller every year. I know. I thank God I'm not playing in Rio in four years' time. <laughs> <laughs> What are they going to be wearing there? I don't know. Not much. Um, but look, that's just part of our sport. We grow up playing beach volleyball on the beach, so we're comfortable. Um, yeah, we, but it's all part of it. And, and I tell you, to play beach volleyball, just, just even if we're fully clothed, two people out there against two people in front of 
15,000 it was in London mm. this year, um, battling it out, you know, that is where you as a person come out. You learn so much through playing sports. So if you've, you guys have kids, um, put them into sport, even if they don't want to, get them playing in a sport, encourage them, go with them to practices, get involved, because it teaches you so much about yourself. And I, I really learn about all my insecurities and I learned how to either cover them or, or improve them and then draw out the strengths in my personalities. I fi found I was a fighter. I love a challenge. I don't like to give up. I like to do things really well. Even making uh, the pumpkin yesterday with my six-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Beautifully carved. She Wouldn't let him touch it. <laughs> she did everything. He didn't get a look in. <laughs> yes, it is very important, and especially as the... Uh, uh, obesity problem in children grows. It's very important to have them involved in sport. I don't know if Ant's wife would necessarily recommend free diving for the children. <laughs> but uh, what, what, do you, what do you have to say about self-confidence? Because you do a lot of uh, co corporate speaking and you mention uh, a concept of T minus one, that, that point where you want to give up. How can someone overcome that? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I find... Um, <laughs> When people think of a challenge, they normally really fixate on that moment where they have to perform. You know, that moment I'm on stage, I'm in front of people, or um, I'm at work and I have to give some difficult feedback to someone. I have to pick up the phone and make a cold call, and we really fixate on the, the execution of the task. There's a psychologist in New Zealand, his name was David Grove, and he talked about this really simple model for looking at trauma and said, rather than focusing on the trauma event itself, look at what happens before and after the trauma and get a, a more sort of um, holistic picture around it. Now, I, I sort of stolen that model and re removed any reference to trauma, and I like to think of when you take on an absolutely difficult challenge for yourself, think of that as time, right? The time when you have to do the challenge. And it's like someone's filming a movie of you and it has all these different frames of this movie. And sure you have this moment time where you do the challenge, but then you have time minus one, time minus two, time minus three. Time minus one is that moment where you most want to give up. It's that moment where you feel stressed out, where you feel anxious, nervous, frustrated. You just want to backpedal and get out of it. But how you cope with that moment where you most want to give up ultimately determines your success or the degree of the success in that moment where you're actually completing your challenge. So for myself and for the athletes I've worked with in the past, I, I spend a lot of time looking at what do you go through just before you perform? How do you manage your physical and emotional state? And how do you become very mindful and accepting of what you're about to go through? And in my sport, that, that's critical. Because if you get it wrong, you don't come back up. Um, in my sport, if you get it wrong, it can be really dangerous. It is. So my sport is uh, amongst one of the most dangerous in the world. Um, we don't have many injuries, but we have this life or death thing. <laughs> so you really want to come back. And there's not a lot of safety in my sport. If you're going to go very deep, it's up to you to get yourself back. So we enter almost like a an slightly altered state, of almost a translate state when we dive. Well, and you've described it as, a, as blissful. Yeah. That, yeah. That's not something that comes to mind to me when I'm thinking I'm, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 metres underwater. I would think, I need to cough. <laughs> <laughs> cough? Um, why, why cough? Why, why not? <laughs> uh, how difficult is it for you to process that, or is it quite easy because you're the one doing it? Is it worse for, say, your wife, who watches you go down and think, yeah, it, it, it possibly is harder for those around me. For myself, like the actual, sp the actual sport, participating in freediving can be incredibly uncomfortable. The pressure that your body is under, even from 30 metres down, uh, it can be like someone grabbing you around the stomach and bear hugging you and someone else simultaneously holding your throat and squeezing you. So you're like tucking your chin and stuff so you're not getting too crushed. Um, so it's very easy to have very negative experience and connotations and thoughts running through your mind. Um, so in order to deal with it, you have to be incredibly mindful. Um, one way to think of it is, if I'm holding my breath and I'm at four minutes, and I start thinking about the next four minutes, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm going to pop up, right? I can't do it. If I think about the last four minutes that I've just endured, then I'll pop up as well. I have to be absolutely mindful. Right now, right here, how am I experiencing this? And I'm okay, being okay with it. It's actually a shame that we uh, only have half an hour for this panel because I really, really wanted to see Anne hold his breath for eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that would have been fantastic, but no, we did want to hear from you because what you've got to say is, is so wonderful. And if you, uh, if you go to Anne's website, annewilliams.com, 
Uh, he actually has uh, one of his uh, speaking moments on there where he shows himself teaching an audience to breathe. And I believe that for some of them, you increased their ability to hold their breath, uh, even, even doubled it. And you know, in that presentation, you managed to help them achieve a new goal. But what I'm curious to know, is it possible to, to teach someone to want to be the best? Are there people that just are mired in mediocrity and think they can't do it? Can you teach someone to set their goals high, to teach them <coughs> to believe that? Um, I think yes. I think you can be taught to, to aim higher and to have greater goals. I think it's your belief system, your limitations that are stopping you from that, or your environment that you've been brought in, up into, your parents, your coaches, people around you telling you or expecting you, even silently, silently to not be able to, to get any further than you are. And one of the great exercises we did with our success coach was just a very simple exercise to finish the sentence that starts with, I am. And if you think about it, the way you would finish that sentence today is exactly who you are. But we've heard today how if we have our sights set higher, then we can actually achieve greatness. Because if you start writing, I am, we started writing simply in 1999, I am an Olympic gold medalist before we won our gold medal in the year 2000. So we started to believe, and it's not just about writing it and it's going to happen, it's actually starting to develop. It's just one little exercise that we use to start to develop that belief. But we also then had to start living as if it was happening. So if you want to achieve this, if you want to be this person, you have to have a look and see what is that person that's already up there doing now that I'm not doing yet. So you have to start living it. So we started living like Olympic gold medalists. We started training like Olympic gold medalists. We started rehabbing like Olympic gold medalists, eating like Olympic gold medalists, doing everything, speaking to the media with the confidence of an Olympic gold medalist, saying, we are going to win an Olympic gold medal. That is our aim. We put it out there. We didn't hold it in just in case it didn't happen. And I'm sure there was still half the stand at Bondi thinking that we weren't going to do it. But, you know, there was a lot of Aussie, 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 oi, 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 that kind of lifted us. And, in fact, it reminds me of a quick story. In Atlanta in 1996, we were playing the Americans on home soil for the bronze medal. And the Americans were going, USA, 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 really loud, chanting. And we sat down halfway through that match, and I said to Nat, and Nat, was Nat is 10 years younger than me. She was only 21. And I said, Nat, gosh, that USA, it's really starting to get to me. And she just looked at me and she said, turn the letters around, Kez. U-S-A. <laughs> A-U-S. She said, they're cheering for us. <laughs> and the first thing I did was what you're doing is laugh. It lightened, the first thing it did was lighten the whole mood, make it uh, lessen the stress levels. And then we went back out there and once they started cheering USA, USA, we were cheering along with them, but we were saying AUS, AUS. And it just totally made me forget the stress and the frustration I had of that chant. And so we learned it doesn't matter what happens to you, it's how you deal with it. And we've heard so much of that already today. But, you know, that's just one little practical example that we use. And we, I take that into my life now all the time. You know, we have a choice of how we react and we have a choice of the attitude that we have. And those challenges, well, they're important, aren't they? Because without the challenge, you don't achieve more. How do you manage to stay at the top? Because you are only 40, but the athletes you're competing against are much younger. They're training full-time. You're a dad. You've got a full-time real job. Uh, how do you maintain that? Yeah, that's the, probably the hardest thing for me at the moment is that my competitors all do this full time. That's all they do. They have, you know, the government buys them cars, boats, pays for all their airfares, they're taken care of. What nationality are they? Venezuelan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it is. You, and you think, oh, I'm, you know, I've got a family, a full time job. It, it does make it really hard. So the thing that I've done is, like, like, here, like I have to set my goals incredibly high and just live and breathe like that's what I'm going to do and that's what I'm going to achieve. Um, the other thing I really focus on is making sure that every year I'm evolving. I have to be different. I can't bring what I did last year because it's not going to be enough anymore. Um, the first time I really learned this principle was because of all those things. I went to a world championship thinking, they've all got coaches. They're wearing stuff that I've never seen before. Um, what is that for? You know, all this great gear that I'd never been exposed to or had a coach. And, and so I quickly figured out that I would have to be better on some different dimension, be it technique, um, mental toughness, whatever. In the first competition I went to, I figured out that um, everyone swims like this, like man from Atlantis with a big monofin on, and everyone swims constant. 
And I, like, I remember going to training once and just sort of kicking and then going, <sighs> gliding, kick, because <sighs> I'm kind of feeling really lazy that day. <laughs> and thinking, wow, I've just swum the length of this pool and maybe one third as many kicks as I would have otherwise. So I trained this way for eight months and didn't tell a soul, went to my very first ever world championships and got through to the final against the world champion. And in the final, he was a world record holder, so he had swum 181 meters on one breath at the time, and I was frightened by this chap. And a um, big Austrian guy, Herbert Nisch. And uh, I got to swim at the same time as him, and the re world record at the time was 181, and I managed to do my funny kick glide and swim to 169. He swam to 171 and got this uh, gold medal and titanium watch worth $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> But I learned a really valuable lesson that um, just by having swum that, after the swim, he looked completely exhausted. And I felt quite fresh because I'd done a third as many kicks as this chap. And now 19 out of the top 20 in the world swim with a kick glide. And I had, had that, held that advantage for, for three years. I stayed in the number, um, number three in the world, um, despite working full time and having a family and all that. So now I'm looking for the next thing. And a Venezuelan sponsor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, But it is, it's, a, it's about stepping outside of the box, and I think we're all so stuck in what we do each and every day that we forget about all, the, all these other ways of doing things. You know, you, well, that's what we did. We stepped outside the box. People thought we were crazy walking on hot coals and broken glass and having a, an a, actually a, an ex-Hollywood actor and a world record firewalker come on board a team of beach volleyball players, you know. No, we still think you're crazy as well. <laughs> so tell us, Gary, when you retire, that must have been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, in fact, such a big challenge that you actually came back. Um, <laughs> was that the biggest challenge you faced? No, look, I don't know why you said that, because I actually enjoyed retiring. Man, I didn't have to get up early and train anymore. The reason I came back was because of a relationship breakup. I had nothing else to do, so I went back to sport. Um, but I, I finally retired because my body was breaking down. I guess that the hardest thing for me when I retired was not feeling guilty about not going to training because I'd gone to training every day and most of the time twice a day and then when I dropped down to once a day, I started feeling really guilty and then, you know, once every second day, really guilty and now I barely train <laughs> at all. But, you know, I'm allowed to. I've done it for 20 years but it was the guilt and I think, you know, women here get that guilt feeling when they go to work and it's, so it's dealing with all these different emotions um, but I think if you keep setting, replace one goal with another. I'm about to do some workshops with the Australian Institute of Sport for retired athletes that are just trying to make that transition after the London Olympics. And the biggest message I'm going to take in there is once you've completed something, just like you've said, Ant, that you, you look for the next challenge. You have to replace that goal with something else. It's like having a bad habit. You quit smoking. What are you going to put in your hand next week? A bottle of water. You know, bring the water up to your mouth all the time instead of the cigarette. You've got to replace it if it's, you know, otherwise you're just going to go downhill. Indeed, and uh, you've also, of course, Kerry's got her, her book outside. Uh, was that another challenge that you used to channel your knowledge into, uh, into something that could help other people? Yeah, originally I wrote my book um, called The Business of Being an Athlete, How to Build a Winning Career in Sport, was because I realised that as a female in Australia in a low-profile sport, I actually have been able to sustain myself as a full-time athlete for so many years, and I wanted to talk about the business side, learning to speak and, and learning to deal with sponsors and the media, and I wanted to teach that to people, but that's now a very small part of it, because I got caught up in the, well, why was I successful? So I wrote a lot about goal setting and backwards planning and, and there's a whole lot of exercise you can do in there as well as a, you know, probably more than one third of the book is on the mindset mm. to be successful because I realise that at the end of the day that's the difference. It sure is. Uh, and you're off to another big event very shortly. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and also tell us if you've ever thought about going back into sports psychology now mm. that you've got what you're after because you originally started it to learn more about uh, extreme sports. You know that now, but you're no longer a sports psychologist, are you? No, I don't work in sports psychology anymore, but I, I am working with one athlete at the moment who, uh, his name's Mark Visser. He is trying to be the first athlete in history to tow into a 100-foot wave. And so mostly I teach him how to hold his breath. <laughs> but a bit of sports psychology as well. Uh, next week I fly out to the Bahamas, which has just been ravaged by a, uh, a hurricane, unfortunately. There is a, a remote island in the Bahamas called Long Island. 
And when you travel right down to this most southern point of this island, there is a beach, and on the beach, you walk down the sand, and there is a hole about the size of a netball court, and it just drops away 200 meters straight down. It's, uh, it's the deepest sinkhole in the world. And so 20 or 30 of the best, deepest divers across the world are flying in for the best part of a month to see who can go the greatest depth uh, on the one breath over there. Well, that's what you call continuing to set goals. Ant Williams, good luck with all Thank of that. You. Kerry Pothast, good luck with everything Thank you're you. doing with your programs. Uh, it's wonderful to hear about how you've achieved so much, but incredible to uh, know that the goal setting doesn't stop. They continue to do it and to achieve. Please thank these two fabulous athletes. Thank you.